Hi, my name is Ashley and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm very nervous. I have not shared my story in um, some time. So I'm a little rusty. Um, so bear with me. And yeah, I'm going to stick with the, the traditional format, what it was like, what happened, and, and what it's like now. So my sobriety date is uh, December 10th, 2016. I just celebrated five years um, here with you all, actually, which was lovely. Um, and it's really, it's really a miracle that I have five years of sobriety because I was a hot mess. Um, I was born to two alcoholics, um, and my, my father was a professional baseball player, so um, a bit of celebrity there, and my mom was a, um, someone who wanted to marry a professional baseball player. <laughs> um, and she wanted all the, the rights and privileges that come with that, so... Um, they, they're different kinds of alcoholics. They did not stay married. Um, when I was about five, they divorced and, uh, my mom promptly remarried someone 10 years younger than her, um, a couple months after they divorced. So, um, I was, I was five and my, my mom was 35 and my new stepdad was 25. <laughs> Being 36 now, I realize how interesting that is. Um, so it, it was a really, it was a, a different dynamic. There are times where my stepdad was like my brother um, kind of feeling, you know. Um, but they were, she married someone who was more on her level, right? So she wanted to be able to go out and have fun. And I don't really think that parenting was something that she ever wanted to do. I think it kind of went along with the professional baseball player wife story. And then once that was no longer, she was just kind of stuck with me. Um, at least that that's how it felt. Um, and so they drank, they went out a lot. Um, I was an only child. I I still am an only child from my, my parents' marriage. And so I spent a lot of time um, parenting myself. Um, my dad's life fell apart as a result of the divorce. Um, he hit a bottom there. And he eventually, um, somewhere in my young childhood, he got sober. I, I think he's been sober like around 25 five years now, something like that. So, um, he did get sober and, um, he got remarried and, um, that was, that was devastating to me. Um, I, I took the divorce really, really hard and this isn't really, you know, this isn't why I'm an alcoholic. I just think it's relevant to, um, some of the feelings that we go through and the way that we experience our experiences, um, might be a little bit different than people who aren't alcoholics. Everything felt like it was my fault because I am that self-centered. I felt like I caused it all. Um, and I'm not that powerful. I know that now, but I didn't then. I thought that somehow I had created all of these situations. And so, um, when I was with my mom and my stepdad, who I spent most of my time with, I felt very alone. And then the person who I so badly wanted to have, you know, um, a young woman, a, a father's role in a young woman's life is very important in my opinion and we were very close and when they left it was it was a very very nasty divorce and so I, I longed for that relationship so badly and then he got sober and he started a new life and I I really didn't the only relationship I had with him after that was he sent money regularly um my mom took him back to court every time he got a rate, you know what I mean? Things like that. So I, I, I feel like I had this, I, I constantly felt this yearning for like something that I didn't have. And I chased that feeling the way that we chase a high from drugs and alcohol for my entire life. Um, it wasn't until I got sober that I learned how to kind of cope with those feelings and to stop looking for things, you know, going to the hardware store for milk type of thing. So, um, I, um, I just, I felt a lot of pain all the time. I was really lonely as a child and the only, the only time I seemed to, um, there wasn't a lot of nurture. So if I was sick, it was like, you know, where the, you know, 
clean it if I like th- I threw up on the floor one time as a kid and I remember going in crying and my mom being like you know where the towels are like get the fuck out of my bedroom why would you wake me up for that so that was the kind of of I was just alone I was just really really lonely um and so it's not surprising now that once I started once I had the opportunity you know I, w- I wanted to be loved so badly. And I know that the first time that I uh, used drugs and alcohol, I think I was around 12. It was directly related to a group of people. Um, I-, I wanted them to like me. And so it wasn't that I wanted to experience the drugs and alcohol. It was that I wanted to do whatever I could do to be loved by, by the people around me. And so um, now when I did have the experience I fell in love with it (laughs) and I was like oh my god like I don't have to worry about all of these feelings anymore and all these people thought I was like so fearless and like I was the youngest one there I was my you know I always wanted to be the only one doing it or the first one or the youngest one or the most special one um and so uh, that that was a big, a big part of why I used. And as a result, I ended up in a lot of situations where I just, I did things for the wrong reason. I had shame. It was like a a rinse and repeat cycle. And I just continued to do that. And then I drank and used more because of all the shame. So um, my first experience with drugs and alcohol was around 12. I told you it was, it was about a group of people. And um, I, It's worth mentioning that part of who I wanted to think I was really, really cool was my best friend's younger brother, who I thought was really cool. (laughs) Um, I I had a a 10, I I made a a very early going of a habit of um, going after other people's property for lack of, (laughs) in a lot of different ways. (laughs) Um, So... um, yeah, so so that was that was my beginning. Um, I I just did whatever I could do. I lied to get out of the house. I think it was all pretty normal behavior, or what I thought was normal behavior for a kid in like middle school where I was at. Um, we did move around a lot. So I was born in New York. Then we were in one elementary school in Florida. My mom and stepdad, because they were active alcoholics, they always wanted. Um, there was always something wrong with the town that they were in, which now I understand a lot better. But, um, you know, uh, the people at his job didn't get it, and he deserved more. So they would leave, and we'd move from county to county to county. And then eventually we moved to San Diego, and that's where I got to start experimenting after leaving Florida. And um, I lost my virginity really early. I was making these decisions based on if I do this drug, if I take this drink, this guy will love me. It was all of this, like, daddy issue shit, you know? So... (laughs) Um, so I lost my virginity at a really, really painfully young age and it was in a, um, it was, I I found out my mom, I came home one day and my mom had had the house in boxes and we were moving again. And I was like, okay, well, if we're going to leave, like, I'm going to go out with a bang. And so I went to this party, and I was, like, just made a decision to lose my virginity, and I did it in, like, a very embarrassing public fashion. I think I, I had decided that no one would like me, so I wanted everyone to, I wanted to be infamous if I couldn't be popular kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> that wasn't even supposed to be funny. <laughs> but I, I, um... Uh, it's, it's hor- I can laugh about it now because we can, but I, I lost my virginity in this like horribly traumatic public display um, as like a 13 year old girl, knowing that I was leaving the next day to move to Albuquerque and um, which is, <laughs> has anyone ever been there? It gets worse. <laughs> so, so I got there and I, I think by this point I was probably drinking and and doing I'll, I do talk about drugs I don't call them outside issues because to me that sounds really weird so I'll mention them but I'm an alcoholic through and through I'm not confused about that um, I identify as an alcoholic um, primarily so um, mostly just drinking and smoking weed but when I got to Albuquerque and I had just had this horribly traumatic experience that I'm not even processing because I'm you know 13 years old And we get there in the summer, and I'm going to start high school, and I don't know anyone, and I meet some kids in the neighborhood, and it's guys, and they're much older, of course, and so, you know, we have a way of um, 
just magnetically pulling in the people that we we want to be around, and it's usually not good, <laughs> not not the good ones. Um, until we we attract what we promote, what we put out into the world, and so until we get um, what we put out into the world gets a little bit more aligned with our higher purpose, those people that we, so it was a lot of older guys in the neighbor, I don't know how I came across these people, but um, I, the, one of the first things they asked me, naturally, because they were great guys, is if I was a virgin. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, I, t I said no, because I wasn't anymore. Um, and so they started asking me about the level of experience that I had, and I lied, and I said that I had a ton of experience. And by now, I had like just turned 14, right? So there was like a month in there, I'm a summer baby. Um, and so I went into this brand new life with this clean slate, with this reputation of a 14-year-old who had slept with like 40 people or some ridiculous number. Um, I, I thought that that would make me seem cool, and I did not realize what kind of repercussions that would have. So um, these people had younger siblings in high school, and the rumor mill got going, and I just created this situation for myself where I was like this new girl who was, you know, all the names that people call someone. And I, I created that for myself, but I did not realize that that's what I was doing, It's just really, really sad. And so that pain and that mi being misunderstood and that lack of belonging just continued to, I mean, the, the cycle just, it, it kept going. And so I got myself into situation, I started experimenting with a lot harder drugs there um, and was constantly in situations where I was feeling like I had to allow people to, you know, allow things to happen to me that I didn't want to sexually. Um, and I talk openly about this stuff because I think it's important. We do, we do this when we're out there and, um, like I am now not confused about the fact that I, that's assault, you know? And I think it's important to, to talk about that too because I didn't want it, but I didn't know how to say no. So I was, just I was just allowing these things to happen and then I thought it was my fault. Also important to mention that my mom, that lack of nurture, you know, everything that happens to you, you could have prevented. Everything that happens in your life is somehow your responsibility is kind of how I was raised by her. So. I kind of had this mentality that this was all stuff that it was my doing. I put myself in this situation, so I kind of had to go along with it, you know. And so all that shame and all that pain is like a, a really, really young person. Um, and I just kept anesthetizing and getting, you know, finding lower companions and, and getting into a lot of trouble. I got into some, like, gang involvement, um, <laughs> which is just, it's ridiculous to say because of where I'm at now, but it was really, really scary. At one point I had people calling the house, like threatening to kill me. I, f I got like straight D minuses. Luckily I was charming enough. I think that, um, I didn't, my teachers didn't want to fail me, but my first year of high school, I like, I basically almost flunked out. And so my parents after, you know, enough of this stuff, um, we're like, we got to get her out of here. Like, this isn't going to work. Something bad's going to happen. And so they decided that we were going to move back to San Diego, where I had went out with a bang thinking I would never see anyone again. And so I moved back to San Diego um, my, for my sophomore year of high school. So I missed that first year where everyone kind of grows together and goes through this big experience of, of moving from middle school to high school together with this lasting impression and a lot of enemies from that. I like ruined somebody's parents bedspread. I mean, it was like a whole thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. So, so I came back to that and it just, it just kind of continued. I mean, I don't need to, the difference was that I realized, okay, uh, I got in, tr I, I'm getting in trouble. And I, at this point had had enough experiences with, you know, I couldn't, I would come home in, in New Mexico and my mom would be like, you're high again, aren't you? And, and I would lie and no. And so occasionally she would drug test me and I wouldn't care and I would fail. And um, at this point, it wasn't the drinking she was concerned about. They were alcoholics and they let me drink with them. But it was the outside issues that, that bothered her. Um, so I knew I wanted to keep using because I couldn't possibly feel the way that I felt um, but I knew that I needed to kind of keep it together so that I didn't get 
I, I needed to keep everybody off my back. Um, during this time, this is about the age that my dad got remarried to. So um, right around 14, my dad finally got remarried. I guess he had, he had, he had been working on getting sober and with this woman for a couple of years and she wouldn't marry him until he got sober. And then he did. And she said, yes. And so, and at that point he kind of, it, it really something else snapped in me from that. And so I developed an eating disorder uh, in addition to all of these other issues. And so that, that has morphed over the years. Um, I'm I'll, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, but so I, I started, it started with dieting, um, really, really severely. And so then there are some particular outside issues that can assist you with not being hungry. Um, there's a couple of them. And so that, that became a, a real thing. So it became like, how skinny can I get? Um, how much can I study? so that my parents know I'm getting good grades. And so it kind of morphed from this like really, really like throwing my life away, like I don't care, I wanna die, to I want to be perfect, but I also feel like I wanna, you know, I still wanna die, but I want everyone to think I'm, I'm doing really well. And so it shifted a little bit at that point. Um, and I'm glad that it did because it kept me alive for, for longer. Um, I, I did pretty well in high school. I even started playing sports. I managed to play water polo and run track while smoking meth. It was very impressive. Um, <laughs> all the while robbing people blind in the locker room. Not the first, not the only time I did it was not in sobriety. I'm talking to my sponsee. Um, <laughs> so I would, yeah, I, 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 I tried to kind of be all things to all people. I wanted to be a good girl. I wanted to get good grades. So I needed the drugs that could help me stay up and study. I wanted to be skinny so the boys would like me. Um, and I, but I also, I found too that I could, when I was drinking, I would absolutely black out and, and be at a complete disaster and not remember anything unless I added some other substances to the mix so it could help me drink longer. Um, so it was just, it was, it was just constant, like, you know, as we do, being out all night, partying, and then just the um, the perfect cocktail, right? You're trying to like do all the math. Like if I do X of this and X and Y of this, then I can be out for this long and then I can wake up at this time. And and it was just a constant calculation of like what I could do to, to keep things um, somewhat manageable, I thought. It sounds pretty unmanageable already. So um, that's what high school looked like for me. Um, and I, I went to college. Surprisingly, um, I, I made a decision to go to U University of California at Santa Barbara, um, which was at the time known for drinking <laughs> uh, on the beach. But I, I followed a guy there. No surprise. I didn't. I this guy that I had dated in high school was going there and we weren't dating anymore, but I was going to follow him so that he changed his mind. Um, so I made an entire decision, like a huge life decision of where to go to school based on that information. Um, and we did, we did date, I got there, so. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so I went to Santa Barbara and I, it was just this constant, like I'm gonna be the best, but I'm just going to feel the worst. It's kind of like what my whole life looked like until I got sober. Um, I, I moved up early. There was this, like, they called it nerd camp, but it was really called freshman summer start program. I was really, I'm going to go up there and take classes before college starts so I can get a jump start. Um, and my alcoholism really took off there. I think if there was any confusion about whether or not I was an alcoholic, it really became apparent there. I really actually experienced a lot of the shaking and the, the constantly being sick. Um, my roommates in the dorms called my room the stink box because I threw up on the floor and didn't clean it up so frequently. Yeah. Um, there's like, there's some videos of me like trying to eat a burrito, but like putting it in my, like the side of my head. Um, <laughs> It, the drinking was really, really bad, and it there's really nothing of note other than that I just continued to do this. It, it's I started driving drunk a lot um, in college too. I after my first year in the dorms, I moved 
off campus out of the area and so I wanted to go back there to party and I would I would do you know I would do the like Irish goodbye Houdini whatever you want to call it and I would wait until everyone was like passed out and then I would sneak out um and drive home I had my little saying I thought it was really fucking cute and it wasn't cute at all I could have killed a lot of people but I would say arrive alive cover one eye um because it would you know stop the lines from blurring and um, just like I, the, the engine of my car blew because I didn't know I had to put oil in it. I was just kind of this, just running around, <laughs> just causing wreckage, constantly in fights with my girlfriends for like leaving them somewhere and not cleaning up or trashing their house or inviting someone over who stole something. Like I was always in trouble and it felt like that kind of my whole life. I was always in trouble with somebody um, and it wasn't, it felt like it shouldn't have been my fault and I couldn't help it and I didn't know what I was doing. I was just miserably alone, always feeling so much shame and guilt um, and not understanding why I couldn't stop making the bad decisions that I was making. And at no point did I think that I needed to stop drinking. I, it, that, that was not, you would think that with a dad who got sober, we're only ready to hear what we're ready to hear. And it's, it's like completely crazy to me when I think back. Like I don't have any recollection of my dad telling me he was getting sober. This is like an after the fact. It never, it never, um, is something that I thought like, oh, maybe I should stop. It was like, I just need to figure out a way to make this work or these people need to change their behavior, which I'm still working on now. Um, <laughs> so I, I got through college um, miserably, but I got through, didn't have uh, great grades or anything, but I got the degree and I did it in three years. I did that in three years because things were getting so bad that I was going to like the grades were getting worse and worse and worse. I got put on academic probation and I was like, okay, if I don't get out of here, I'm not going to graduate. And so when everyone went home for the summer, I stayed and I took as many classes as possible and I did some other things to get out of there early. Um, I used that as like, I graduated in three years because I'm such a high achiever, but it was really like a, I'll never get out of here. And if I don't graduate, my parents will fucking kill me. So all this time too, I'm still doing all of everything I'm doing. I'm doing it because I want my parents to like me. Um, and now I realize that it's, it's just, it's all attached to that, like the God size hole, um, God shaped hole, whatever it is we say in that, that I, now I know how to fill it, but then it was just, it was a mystery to me. Um, and I really thought it was other people that were going to make me feel better. So, um, after college, I got a job. I wanted to work in sports to be kind of like my dad. Um, and so I, I got a job with the Anaheim Ducks uh, ice hockey team. And it was really fun. They won the Stanley Cup. We went out partying um, like every night. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> um, I got, and that's when I got my first DUI, right after I turned 21. Um, I guess my only DUI, but I... I was living in Orange County. I moved a lot too. I picked that up from my parents. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> um, so I I uh, got got a DUI. I flipped my car into one of those giant like things that tell you how fast you're going. <laughs> um, <laughs> the big ones with like the trailer hitch, and. Um, it was, it wasn't going very fast either, but I like, I had this like, I don't know what I thought I was, but I wanted this. That's the other thing. My dad, I, when I blew the engine out of the other, the forerunner, my dad bought me a new car. So he wasn't very present, but he would send things my way. Right. And so, um, he, I wanted a, uh, uh, Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution. I don't know if anyone knows what this was, but I thought I was like, too, like in Fast and Furious, one of the movies. So... <laughs> I, I flipped that thing into this, like rolled it into that. I was fine. Um, I tried to convince the cops that it was because of my like Prozac or something that, and yeah, it didn't work. I, um, afterwards though, when I went back to see the car, I spent the night in jail. Um, I, I thought I was funny and it's really, really disgusting how funny that I thought I was. I, I remember being in jail and um, 
they they threw another girl it was just like a holding cell overnight but they threw another girl in the cell one night and she was like seatbelt rash and she had like gotten her period in the cell she didn't speak any english and me and this other girl were just like wasted and we had used the toilet paper to make like clothes to keep warm and we wouldn't give it to this girl like I'm just still right like I don't see it I'm an asshole I'm inconsiderate I'm completely selfish I think everything I'm doing is cute and funny but I also hate myself and I don't like anything that's going on in my life but I'm not responsible for any of it just constantly miserable completely unmanageable um and so when I went back to see the car, the passenger seat, the headrest, was completely sliced in half. A piece of metal from that thing had gone through. So if anyone would have been in the car with me, they would have been decapitated. Um, that woke me up a little bit. Um, I went to my classes, but it was one of those like juggling acts, like I'm going to go to the DUI classes. My dad paid for it. Big, huge mistake. Um, He's since, I think, went to Al-Anon and figured some shit out because as a sober alcoholic to be too, enabling all that, I mean, whatever. Um, that's, that's another story for another day and another meeting. <laughs> um, I, I went to my classes, but it was still like, a, how soon, how, how long before the class can I drink that when at the time when I get there to the DUI class and I blow, it'll be out of my system, like kind of just gambling with it the whole time, not really understanding the severity of it, had no intention of, of quitting drinking. I thought that quitting drinking would remove the only thing. I think that at that point you start to learn a little bit about possibly quitting drinking, right? In those DUI classes, that would be the only thing that would take away the only thing that ever made me feel like I could function in this world with the amount of pain and shame and insecurity that I was carrying. I could not get up and talk to a group of people. Like there would be no way, I, I, I couldn't do anything. And my relationship with my mother was very alcohol fueled. Every time I did see her, we would drink together. We would do a lot of things, like other substances together. And I was like, I'm not going to have a relationship with my mom. Like, there were so many reasons why I thought there was no way. I just could not live with alcohol. I don't. And I think that a lot of us experience that. Before we come in here, we don't think that there's any way. Like, how could I? Mean, oh, like, that's just not an option. So um, this kind of stuff continued. I got jobs. I got fired multiple times. I got let go. And it was always with a group of other people for a reason that wasn't completely related to my performance. I know that if I wasn't a raging alcoholic, I wouldn't have been let go. I would have been with the group of people that were kept retained in those situations. At the time, I just used whatever I could hang on to as a reason that, you know, oh, I was laid off because the company got acquired or I was laid off because, um, you know, they had financial resources were short or something like that. So I always had excuses. I always managed to manipulate the information. I was inconstitutionally incapable of being honest with myself for a very, very long time. I think that's something that um, I struggled with even once I got into the rooms a little bit. And it's getting a lot better now. But um, I, yeah, and I just kept, I'd, I'd kind of, it looked like this, my journey to the bottom. It was like, I, I thought I would get my shit together for just a little bit and then it would, would get even worse. And it's kind of that disease doing push-ups thing. It really, it, it brings you back down, but a little bit lower each time. Um, and so by now I, I'm in San Francisco chasing some dream of like being at, with a software company that IPOs and there's keg parties and it's really cool and fun and everyone does drugs in the bathrooms. And that really is where things took off for me. And, um, I, I had this goal, you know, thanks mom again. Um, I do love her. We have a great relationship today, which I'll, I will get sober shortly. Um, I, I, uh, I had found a boyfriend who would take care of me and let me stop working. And that was really the goal. That's all I wanted. We would get married. And during that period, since I didn't have a job and then I decided I wasn't going to work, uh, again, um, the drug use and the alcoholism, it just took off. I was just driving around in someone else's car with wine in the front seat and, you know, it, 
an eight ball in my bra and that was just how I rolled I was picking up dry cleaning I was I thought I was like this cute housewife but I had open wounds on my face from ripping it apart all night long and you know I was doing things like going to CVS to pick up prescriptions for my family um my boyfriend family the fuck (laughs) and 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 peeing my pants while talking to the person at the pharmacy counter and then just being like I'll take care of this later like being aware that it was happening and not thinking that that was unmanageable just like pissing myself while talking to a person in a store so it that's kind of that's where I got um he kicked me out I had nowhere to go and I spent about a week wandering around San Francisco without anywhere to live um, with the open wounds on my face, without, you know, shoes on my feet. And I mean, I took his car. Um, and I hope he found Helen on because... <laughs> um, no, that was a really powerful amends I made to that one. But so I, I ended up without anywhere to live, without anywhere to go. And at some point, you know, as the journey goes on, I, I decided to call my dad. And I remember the night before I had done... I had put so much different stuff in my body. I I truly thought I was going to die. And I was like, if I wake up in the morning, you know, it was one of those kind of foxhole things, dear God, if you save me, I'll never do it again. Um, I, I thought my heart was actually going to explode out of my chest. I, I, uh, I called my dad and I was like, I think I need help. And, and he was like, I'll, whatever you want, like do the research. And I was like, but I can't go without my French bulldog. So I, he found a rehab that would let me take my dog because I thought that's what I needed to get sober. I went to Malibu, um, to Cliffside Malibu for 45 days where I got acupuncture and massages and a private chef and my French bulldog. And it's a miracle when I got out, I didn't stay sober, you guys. So weird. I don't know what happened. Um, I had all of the, the things that I needed. So uh, then shit got real because I got out and I moved into a sober living and I relapsed there. After talking them into letting me be the assistant house manager, I relapsed while while being in charge of all the other people. And that's when shit got really real because he was like, you need to clean up your act. And um, I went to a detox facility and I started the journey uh, like on my own. And I was, I I managed, um, I started going to meetings, which I didn't think was something I needed to do after the rehab stint. It was like that, that's not part of it. It was like a holistic rehab. I could do all these other things. So, but after the relapse and the sober living, I moved into a different sober living and I kind of started the journey the right way. And I started going to meetings and I got a new sponsor and I worked the steps. Um, and I found a lot, I found a lot of peace and i I made a lot of really powerful amends. Um, I cleaned out a lot of that shame and guilt and I had someone, I found, you know, the person who I asked to be my sponsor had had a lot of similar experiences, wasn't surprised by any of those weird sexual things and and all of that stuff that I thought made me like completely unlovable. Um, And I really, uh, the program, people in the program loved me until I could learn how to love myself. Um, But there were a couple of suggestions I didn't take. And one was to not date, specifically older men with a lot of money. (laughs) Um, And so I got into a relationship against my sponsor's suggestion, and um, he was a DJ, Um, a CEO by day and like a house music DJ by night. It was very glamorous. And so I was all the, you know, I was doing all of the things, but I think deep down I was still looking for that, that, uh, the meal ticket. I was still looking for someone else to do the work so that I didn't have to, for someone to love me and take care of me so that I didn't have to love and take care of myself. And I didn't know that at the time, I thought I was doing all the right things and that she just didn't understand and that we were in love. And then he broke up with me. And um, there were a couple people at my job at that time that didn't know that I was sober. And they invited me out for happy hour because I was going through this horrible breakup. And um, you know, I had a, a really good taste of the program. And I had done a lot of good work, and I knew a lot of people in, in the in the rooms. But I, I still had that uh, that inability to be honest with myself. I think about what was really going on with me, not loving myself, um, and and so when, when I got invited to that happy hour, I just you know something inside me. I was like, sure, I'll go. 
and I had a glass of wine and then a week later I had no money I almost lost my apartment I was in a stranger's house you know I had done all the drugs I had it was all all over again after two years of sobriety um and so I think they there's some saying about like a beer full of belly and a head full of AA and I have never felt more like you can't, you can't enjoy it out there anymore. <laughs> Y'all ruined my fun. <laughs> so I, uh, I, in the middle of that, you know, having almost lost everything, but not quite. So having like a scrape of, you know what, if I do this right now, I can, I can, I can get better and I can do it for me. And it doesn't matter what I lose or who is mad or whatever. I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it the right way. And I called my sponsor at three o'clock in the morning and I was like, here's the deal. I fucked up. I am going to a detox facility. They don't open till nine. If I go to sleep right now and I wake up and feel better, I'm going to run from this. So I am going to a bar that opens at six o'clock in the morning. And you are picking me up at nine and you are taking me to detox facility, please. (laughs) And uh, otherwise, there's no way that I'm going to go. And she was like, absolutely. And so bless San Francisco. You can go to a bar at six in the morning Um, called Aces High on Sutter. (laughs) That was my last drink. Um, And so I, I went, I walked there and I waited for it to open. I told all the bartenders my whole story and how I was gonna get sober and like that I was just trying to enjoy myself. I'm not kidding. It was, and she came and got me and I went back to the detox facility that taught me the lesson the first time. I had called them and they were like, we actually don't take civilians anymore. We only take veterans now. And I was like, okay, well, is there anything you can do? I don't know where else to go. I just need a couple of days please and she's like call me on my cell phone in a few minutes and I'll help you out and so I called her she like snuck me into this like homeless veteran facility um and I um when I was there I read the entire first 164 in the three days that I was there I made a commitment to myself and to God that it was just it was done I had all the evidence that I needed I took one drink and my whole life went back after two years of sobriety Um, There was not any confusion about what I needed to do. I was going to take every suggestion this time. Um, In there, I met a really cool guy who was wanted to date me. And I was like, no, absolutely not. I'm not dating whatsoever. We stayed friends for until my sponsor said that I could date. um, And he's now my husband five years later. (laughs) Uh, We just got married in October. But I was he he I really I had to. I had to stand up for the fact that I needed alone time to love myself and to work the program and to not be distracted by anything else. And so um, I started over and I, I worked a couple of different jobs. I did it the hard way. I only had a bus pass, you know, because I had really lost everything, the ability to afford a lot of the things that I had gained in that two years sober. And so I really, I just went back to square one and I did it all for me. And so when I hear people that are like, well, I need this and I need that to get sober, I thought that too, hence the Cliffside Malibu retreat. But but really when it came down to it, once you've once you've admitted that you're truly powerless and that your life is unmanageable, you can really make a beginning. Um, And so from there, I was able to do the steps again um, with a lot more meaning and purpose behind them. And um, I really formed a relationship with my higher power and I didn't make someone else that power. Um, That's been something that I have to go back to. Um, Turning it over is something that I'm still working on. I think we work on that one every day. but yeah, I won't go through all the steps, but but I think that, you know, when you come in, if you're if there's any question, you really have to be ready and it takes what it takes for each person. And for me, that relapse was I don't think relapse has to be a part of everyone's story, but for me it was absolutely necessary for me to get into enough pain to do this for myself and not do it for someone else. Because I spent my whole life trying to do things that would make other people love me. And so that that last that last incident was really, really crucial. Um, it could happen again. I see it happen to people all the time. And so I choose to go to meetings and be of service. You know, I have a sponsor. I talk to her regularly. I sponsor other alcoholics. I'm not willing to not do the things that will keep me sober because I've been back out after having some sobriety and it is not worth it. So um, I think I almost took up enough time. So I think I'm going to leave it there. Thank you.